Okay, we'll get started. Hello, my name's Charlie Pick and I am the Tissue Viability Nurse Advisor for Coloplast. Um, and we are here today to do our third and final um, series of our webinar series. So today we're going to look at treatment in our Prepare to Heal series. So having assessed and prepared the wound for optimal healing, we're going to learn how to simplify the treatment regimes that you use. So our learning objectives for today are to understand the difference between healing by primary intention and secondary intention. We're going to understand the, the gap and the challenges of not managing the gap appropriately. We're going to discuss the dressing solutions available and the types of wounds that they can be used on. And we're going to see how we can simplify the management of the gap. And at the end, we're going to think about the treatment objectives of the wounds that you have assessed and prepared in order to devise an appropriate treatment plan. And we'll look at some case studies. So here at Coloplast, we like to simplify wound management. And we, in doing so, we have um, come up with the three step approach. Now, step one is assessment, the first webinar that you will have come to. And assessment um, is absolutely paramount in defining treatment objectives. So our assessment needs to be a full holistic assessment of our patient. We don't want to just look at the hole in the patient, the wound. We need to look at the patient as a whole person, find out what's going on with their comorbidities, what their past medical history is um, and do a really robust assessment holistically. And then we can do a robust assessment of the wound. And once we've done that robust assessment, we'll we'll move on to step two, which is preparation. And with wound preparation, we look not only at the wound bed, but the wound edge and the peri wound skin. And in preparing our wounds, what we're doing is removing the barriers to healing. We're creating that optimum healing environment to help our wounds move towards that healing process. When we've done step two, preparation, we'll move to step three, which is treatment. So that's what we're going to dis discuss today. So we'll look at the portfolio of dressings to manage a wound of any depth and stage of healing. So this is where your treatment objectives come in and, and you look at what it is that you're trying to do in the treatment of that wound. So I'm going to play you a video. This is just a bit of anatomy and physiology um, of the stages of wound healing. So it's just going to go through what the stages of wound healing are and that will help later on in this presentation. In every wound type, the hemocyst runs through a cascade of phases, which partly overlap in time. The immediate reaction to injury is a contraction of the capillaries to reduce bleeding. Red blood cells and platelets released from damaged blood vessels flow into the wound, aggregate and produce the plug or clot in the wound. The first step in the inflammatory process is dilatation of the capillaries. Increased permeability of the capillary allows serum and white blood cells to migrate into the wound area. Here, the white blood cells differentiate into different cells, including neutrophils and macrophages. Neutrophils and macrophages are attracted to the damaged cells and bacteria by chemical substances. They become phagocytic and engulf dead tissue and bacteria. Once all the dead tissue is eliminated, the inflammation gradually subsides. During the proliferation phase, the wound is filled with granulation tissue. Granulation tissue consists of newly formed capillaries and connective tissue. The formation of new capillaries, angiogenesis, ensures that nutrients are supplied for granulation tissue formation and is essential for wound healing. Fibroblasts are the predominant cells in the proliferation phase. They migrate into the wound site from the surrounding tissue and start to multiply. In the last part of the proliferation phase, the wound is made smaller by wound contraction 
Wound contraction is brought about by specialized fibroblasts with contractile properties called myofibroblasts. When the granulation tissue filling the wound is almost at level with the surrounding skin, re-epithelialization starts. The epithelial cells change shape to facilitate locomotion and crawl across the wound bed to cover it. Migration stops as soon as cells regain contact. The cells change back to their normal appearance and reattach themselves to the basement membrane. The wound is closed. The transition from granulation tissue to scar tissue involves reorganization and maturation of collagen fibers to maximize tensile strength. During remodeling, the fibers are orientated along the lines of tension and cross-linked to form a strong wound. Remodeling can take up to two years after wounding. Okay. Um, just after that video, I do have uh, my colleagues Ellen Buckley and Sam Wharton uh, manning the chat. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to pop the uh, questions in the chat and we'll answer them as we go along. So how do, how do wounds heal? So they can heal in two ways. We can have primary intention, which is the closing of the wound within hours of injury, where the wound edges can be brought together without tension. So using sutures, adhesive strips. So these can be your trauma wounds, your skin tears, things like that. Well, um, any sort of surgical wounds um, that, that are closed using sutures. These are our primary intention wounds. And then we have secondary intention. So this is when primary closure, closure is not possible. Uh, wounds should not be left open, uh, wounds, sorry, wounds should be left open to heal spontaneously by the process of contraction and re epithelialization So if you think about your pressure ulcers, your leg ulcers, these are the types of wounds that heal from secondary intention. So we're allowing the body to do what it needs to do naturally, and it builds that wound up from the base up. So healing by primary intention, as we've said, uses sutures or clips. Uh, normally used with surgical wounds, they tend to be uncomplicated acute wounds, which are generally um, left to heal with by primary intention. And they're not suitable for long term chronic wounds or those with a large cavity. Healing by secondary intention allows the body to naturally heal the wound from the base up, meaning new tissue, new tissue and capillary formation, which you've just seen in the video. This secondary intention healing is used with hard to heal or chronic wounds, wounds that are infected and all those unsuitable for healing by primary intention. Wound healing like this can trans transition between healing stages and the inflammatory stage can be prolonged if there is an infection or biofilm. And complex wounds should be monitored closely by those staff trained to do so. So our treatment objectives when we're looking at our wounds, your wound assessment and your preparation will lead to identifying um, what your objectives of treatment will be. And they should aim to support the optimum healing environment for the wound. And that, that's ultimately what we need is that lovely optimum healing environment, a nice uh, moist wound healing environment. So your treatment objectives could be some of the following. So you might be looking at management or prevention of that exudate or exudate pooling. And if we're not managing the exudate appropriately with the dressings, the exudate can leak out onto the peri wound skin and cause maceration at that wound edge of the peri wound skin. Um, we're at higher risk then of infection if we're having exudate pooling. So this might be one of your management objectives. That ties in with your protection of your peri wound skin. We don't want this peri wound skin to become macerated or excoriated. We don't want that peri wound skin to start breaking down and, and actually end up with a bigger wound than what we started with. You could be thinking about depth or cavity to the wound and how you manage that and how you manage it appropriately with the dressings that are avail available to you. 
Or you could be thinking about infection and how we manage that infection, keeping it localised to the wound and stopping it from spread, spreading, becoming a spreading infection or a systemic infection, which is not what we want for our patients. And if you remember, identifying and treatment of any underlying cause is integral to wound healing. So we need to find out what the cause of that wound is and we need to make sure that we're managing that cause to be able to heal our patients. So when a dressing doesn't fit properly, a gap can form underneath it. And if this if we have this gap, that creates space for the exudate to pull and sit there. And this is where bacteria likes to grow in this nice wet environment, that nice ex that nice pool of exudate. The pools of exudate lead to that bacterial growth, which then leads to that risk of infection. So we need to try and prevent this from happening. And as I said earlier, if exudate leans, uh, leaks onto the wound edges and peri wound skin, they become macerated, which can delay wound healing, can be an, a risk of infection, but can also cause that wound to become bigger in size. If the gap is not managed um, properly, then pools of exudate can occur and start a cascade of challenges. So we get this pooling of the wound exudate, we then increase the risk of infection, and then we get leakage leakage and maceration to the wound edge and that peri wound skin. And 91% of healthcare professionals face these challenges with exudate pooling, um, the increased risk of infection and the leakage and or the maceration of that um, wound edge and the peri wound skin. So we need to try and manage the gap of our wounds more appropriately. The challenges of the gap in our current practice are 42% of healthcare profession professionals experience leakage and maceration. 24% of healthcare professionals experience infection with wounds and 50% of healthcare professionals choose to use a, fi a filler um, for these types of wounds. And obviously this is going to impact on the patient's quality of life. They could end up with an infection, which means that wound is going to be likely be there for longer. It could increase their exudate levels. It could increase um, their pain. There may be some malodor with that wound. It might mean that they, the patient has to either go to their practice more frequently or the district or community nurses might have to visit that patient more frequently. So there's, there's a cascade of challenges here that we need to try and manage. Now, it doesn't matter what the wound is or where the wound is, all wounds will have gaps, no matter what the depth is. These wounds could be quite superficial, but there is still a gap there. They could be very deep. There could be bone exposed in that wound. But it doesn't matter how deep they are. All of all wounds that we see will have a gap no matter what the depth is. And we need to make sure that we manage that gap effectively. Now, managing the gap, people often think of we need a filler to manage the gap. But do we? Do we always need to use a filler to manage that gap? And the answer to that is no. 80% um, of wounds that we see are less than two centimetres deep. And if you have a good primary dressing that conforms to the wound bed, you don't need to worry about the gap there. If your wound is less than two centimetres deep and you are using a foam dressing that conforms to the wound bed, you will no longer have a gap. You won't have the challenge of exudate pooling. OK, and sometimes um, fillers can be used in wounds that are less than two centimetres deep. And I would challenge whether that is actually required. As long as you have a, a, a primary dressing that conforms to that wound bed, you don't need to use a filler. If you have undermining wound edges or tunnelling, then this is where you would use a filler um, and then use uh, your foam dressing as your, as your secondary dressing. And if we're using fillers, that's going to drive up the total cost of treatment because we're not just using one dressing now, we're using two dressings. So if you think 80% of wounds are less than two centimetres deep, we don't need to use a filler for all of those wounds. So we're going to have a little look about uh, the dressing selections that are available. And um, there are various dressing types available to us as clinicians and knowing what each one does is essential because that will help you manage that wound effectively. If you know what that dressing can do, 
then you know that you're putting it on the right type of wound. Commonly used dressings can be broken down into categories below. So we've got foams, antimicrobials, which you'll be using for your infected wounds or your wounds with a bio burden, hydrocolloids, contact layers, gelling fibres and alginates, polyurethane film, odour absorbing and hydrogels. So we're going to look at some of these in a bit more depth. So hydrogels are used, they're appropriate for use for dry and sloughy necrotic wounds, as well as wounds with a mix of necrotic and granulating tissue. And they must be used with a secondary dressing. Often, um, so hydrogels, is, it, it's in the name, they're a gel, and they may be used throughout the healing process to provide that moist healing environment. It's a viscous gel, which leads to gentle debridement but you must use a secondary dressing with these. Contact layers are appropriate for low, medium or highly exuding chronic and acute wounds and they're used with an absorbent secondary dressing and can be used under compression. And what contact layers do is they protect the tissue from direct contact of other dressings. So this reduced the risk of trauma, which could be caused by secondary dressing adhering to the wound bed. It allows exudate to pass through for absorption by the secondary dressing. And they're commonly made from silicon, but can be um, also made from impregnated gauze. Now hydrocolloids, um, these are appropriate for low to moderately exuding chronic wounds and uh, superficial acute wounds, and they can be used as either a primary or secondary dressing. Now there is an adhesive mixed with a moisture absorbent molecule, and what happens with hydrocolloids is it's, there's a viscous gel that gets formed on contact with the exudate from the wound, and it absorbs the exudate, but it does not adhere to the wound bed. Now, hydrocolloids are semi-permeable. Um, they have a top film which allows that transmission of oxygen and water vapour and acts as a barrier against water and contaminants. So it stops that bacteria from getting in. Foam dressings or silicon foam dressings are appropriate for low, medium and high exuding wounds. And they can be used as a primary or secondary dressing. Now, as I said earlier, with 80% of wounds being less than two centimetres deep, if you use biotane silicon for your primary dressing, this dressing conforms to the wound bed, so you don't have that issue with the gap up to two centimetres. So if you have a wound that is less than two centimetres deep, you can use biotane silicon as your primary dressing. You do not need to use a filler. Foam dressings absorb wound exudate while maintaining a moist wound environment. There is, they have a semi-permeable top film which allows transmission of oxygen and water vapour, whilst providing a barrier against water and contaminants, including bacteria. So it lets that oxygen and water out, but it stops um, bacteria from getting into that dressing. And it's suitable for use in, combina in combination with compression therapy. So the so foam dressings can be used under compression therapy. Some foam dressings can also contain active ingredients, for example, silver, which is indicated for infected wounds and wounds at risk of infection. And some dressings also contain ibuprofen, which is indicated for painful wounds and can really help with those chronic painful wounds for our patients. Gelling fibres and alginates, so these are appropriate for your cavity wounds, wounds with slough and moderate to heavily exuding partial to full thickness wounds. Gelling fibres and alginates will always require a secondary dressing to keep them in place. And how they work is on contact with wound exudate, gelling fibres and alginates form a cohesive gel for a moist wound healing environment. Again, gelling fibres and alginates may contain active ingredients such as silver, which we would use for infected wounds or wounds with a bio burden or at risk of infection. And this is what you would use for your wounds that are greater than two centimetres in depth. So you would use a gelling fibre or an alginate um, to, to pack your wound 
Um, and then you would use a, a secondary dressing, so probably a foam dressing to keep that um, gelling fibre or alginate in place. But you still want to make sure that the, the secondary dressing that you're using conforms down into that wound bed where appropriate um, to stop that gap from occurring. And then we have our topical antimicrobials, which are used for managing wound infection and bio burdens. And they're available in lots of different forms. Um, some of the forms of topical antimicrobials are liquids. Um, you can get pastes, creams, ointments, sprays and impregnated dressings. And how you use um, antimicrobial and the frequency of application will depend on the products that you're using. Um, so if you're using perhaps uh, liquids or pastes or creams, some of these may need, may need to be reapplied more than once a day. So they maybe need reapplication several times a day. Some can only be used for a, a very short period of time, depending on the type of product that you're using and, um, and how the antimicrobial is um, given to that wound bed. And some are left in contact with the wound for several days. So if we look um, here, we have the biotain silicon AG dressing. This is a silver impregnated dressing and it has a sustained release of, of silver. So that that wound while that dressing on is getting a continued um, flow of that silver um, into that wound bed to help fight the infection that's there or help reduce that bio burden. But there are lots of different types of topical antimicrobials used in wound management and some of these include honey, PHMBs, um, iodine and your silver impregnated dressings. So at Coloplast, as I said, we like to simplify wound care. We like to make things easy. Wound care can be extremely um, complex and difficult and we like to make it much easier. So if you have a look at this table for your superficial and low exuding wounds, we would recommend a biotain silicon light. It has the 3D fit technology whereby the it conforms to the wound bed, um, but it absorbs the wound exudate vertically. Also, um, if you have wounds up to two centimetres in depth, then you will be looking at the biotain silicon, silicon dressing with 3D fit technology. And any of your deeper wounds, so these are wounds that are deeper than two centimetres or they have uh, undermining um, or tunnelling, then we would recommend the use of biotain uh, fibre as your primary dressing and then biotain silicon could be used as your secondary dressing. And with your infected wounds, if they're so again, if they're up to two centimetres in depth, we would suggest using your biotain silicon AG with 3D fit technology. Um, and if you've got any undermining, um, then we would recommend the biotain alginate AG to put into that wound bed. So this information that is on this slide is for general guidance only, and it should not replace anyone's clinical judgment. And if you're ever unsure when you're looking at your wounds and trying to decide what dressings it is that you need for to meet your objectives for that treatment for the patient, then you can also always seek your local TVN for further advice. So before we move on to the case studies, I'm just going to go to Ellen and Sam just to see if there's any questions in the um, chat so far. Hi Charlie, uh, it's Ellen. Um, Hi Ellen. Nothing, nothing's come through so far. I've been asking some messages in the chat around, you know, how the gap is normally managed to reduce the risk of um, um, exudate pooling, risks of infection and maceration. Um, I've been asking people what does conformability mean to them when they're choosing a dressing mm -hmm. um, and, and what their current practice is in relation to wounds um, up to and beyond two centimetres in depth. Um, nothing has come through yet. It's obviously a very quiet group. They're very shy. Um, <laughs> so I would encourage everybody, you know, to make your comments. It doesn't have to be a question, just a comment about what your current practice is will be really good and we can sort of generate some discussion because I think in events like these everybody learns don't they? Absolutely. Even if you don't, even if you don't want to ask the question yourself you learn from what other people are doing in their yeah. current practice so it's really good to get um, um, discussion generated in, in, in platforms like this so please do keep your comments 
and um, questions coming in and we'll continue to answer them. So I'll let you go through the case studies, Charlie. Brilliant. Thank you, Ellen. So we're just going to have a look at some of these case studies that we've um, that we've worked with some healthcare professionals on. Um, so this is Mr H and he is a 90 year old um, gentleman. He's got no comorbidities and he's had a mixed etiology leg ulcer for more than 10 years. Um, unfortunately, his ABPI, so um, his ankle brachial pressure index was outside of the normal parameters. So he wasn't suitable for full compression. Um, and all this gentleman wanted was to be able to go on holiday. And he hadn't been on holiday since he'd had his leg ulcer because he didn't think that he would be able to manage that, that wound abroad. Um, so the outcome for this gentleman was that he would be able to be confident to travel again with having this wound or hopefully that we could heal the wound and he didn't need to worry about it. So our assessment, um, from, from our assessment, our management goals were obviously to create that optimal healing environment by preparing the wound bed, edge and peri wound skin. So we needed to remove that non-viable tissue that was sat in that wound bed, manage the exudate coming from this wound and the bac bacterial burden that was sitting there, protect any of the granulation and epithelial tissue that um, had begun to grow and protect the skin and the surrounding skin. And how we did this, so we did wound preparation using all prep pads. So we um, prepared the wound bed, the wound edge and the peri wound skin. And you can see from day one to day three that there is a difference in that wound bed. And we've managed to remove some of that devitalized tissue from the wound bed and remove some of the um, dry skin from the, the surrounding peri wound skin. And what we used to treat this wound was biotane AG non-adhesive. Um, and after 54 days, you can see that there was a huge improvement for this gentleman. So the results for him were over more than 10 years of care, Mr H had found wound preparation far too painful to tolerate. And since using the all prep pad for wound preparation, um, Mr H found that he could tolerate this and his wound had made visible and significant pro progress. And I think if your patients can see um, progress in that wound when you're doing your wound preparation or with the dressings that you're using, they're far more likely to comply because they can see an improvement. There is a visual there for them to be able to see, well, actually, this has gone from this size to this size or I've had lots of dead tissue sat on this wound bed for 10 years and now I haven't got any. So it's really good for them to be able to see what is actually happening. Um, Mr H was able to tolerate just 10 um, millimetres of mercury in compression. So he had a liner put on after just day three and he couldn't have done this before due to the pain and exudate that was coming from this wound. So after managing the infection and the exudate levels with the biotain AG non-adhesive, Mr H was able to start sharing in his care by using biotain silicon and a hosiery kit. And after the after 54 days of treatment, this wound healed. So you can imagine this this gentleman had these wounds for over 10 years and in just 54 days, using a good assessment, good wound preparation, and the appropriate treatment, we managed to get this gentleman healed. And he eventually managed to go on his holiday and enjoy being abroad again for the first time in a very long time. So it just highlights the importance of good wound, good holistic and wound assessment, good wound preparation of the wound bed, wound edge, and that peri wound skin, and then good treatment. So making sure that you're managing those objectives of that wound and um, and applying the appropriate tre treatment for that wound. Now this case study, it's quite through some pictures for you all, um, is Mr D and he is a 55 year old gentleman. Um, now he had his left hallux, his left big toe amputated due to type 2 di diabetes and arterial insufficiency. Um, this gentleman was having multiple dressings, daily changes um, to try and management, manage the exudate levels. Um, there was infe infection in this wound and there was quite a lot of concern that perhaps this gentleman would eventually lose his foot, not just his big toe. So after a, a holistic 
assessment of of the gentleman himself and of his wound um the the management goals were identified as removing that non-viable tissue in that wound bed managing that exudate because as you can see that is a very wet wound you can see the exudate on the surrounding skin so it's not been managed effectively um, we need to manage the bacterial burden in that wound bed and protect the granulation tissue that is there and that surrounding skin so that that wound that surrounding skin doesn't become further lacerated and our wound itself doesn't become much bigger so again, we used all prep pad for wound preparation. And as you can see at week nine, there was a huge improvement in this wound. And we used biotane silicon AG to, um, for the treatment of this wound. Now, as this wound isn't greater than two centimetres, the biotane silicon AG was appropriate dressing for this wound because it will conform to that wound bed. It won't have that gap. It will manage that exudate and protect our surrounding skin from any leakage um, causing maceration. Um, and by week 14, this wound had almost healed. So we've gone from this gentleman potentially losing his whole foot to actually heal, really on the way to healing by week 14, just from using all prep pad to prepare that wound bed, wound edge and the peri wound skin and the biotane silicon AG. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> And the results for this were that the wound had decreased in size from 18 centimetres by seven centimetres. That's quite a significant size of wound to four centimetres by one centimetre in just 14 weeks. That is a huge reduction in the size of that wound. The top of the wound where the toe was, was now healed. As you can see in the picture, week nine, it's already starting to heal and week 14 has healed at that, that end of the wound. The exudate levels to the remaining open area are now very low and there are no signs of a localised infection and the patient's pain score is only 2 out of 10. The wound no longer requires an antimicrobial dressing um, to manage that bacterial load and therefore was then being treated with biotane silicon. And again, this gentleman, Mr D, went on to heal um, completely. Just using two products, which is amazing if you think how many products sometimes that we're using on wounds, just two products have healed this gentleman in little over 14 weeks, which is absolutely amazing. And then we have Jamie. Now, Jamie is a 39 year old gentleman who had an ischial pressure ulcer present for 15 years. Now, if you think, Jamie's 39 and he's already had this pressure ulcer for 15 years. That is a significant amount of his life that he has had this, this pressure ulcer for. Now, Jamie suffers with spina bifida and he walks with crutches, but he is incredibly independent. Um, he has a very busy work life and a very busy social life and he doesn't take any medications at all. Now, holistic assessment and wound assessment were complete. And what the management goals for, for Jamie's wound was to remove that non-viable tissue. As you can see that here at day one, there's lots of non-viable tissue here. There's some rolled edges. You can tell from looking at this that this is a chronic wound. We need to manage the exudate levels and the bacterial burden and protect this surrounding skin. Now, we did this using all prep pad and we treated Jamie's wound with biotane alginate AG and dressings from the bi Biotane 3D Fit technology range. And the reason that we use the Biotane Alginate AG is because this wound was deeper than two centimetres. So we needed to use that alginate to pack that wound so that we could manage that gap effectively. Now you can already see a huge difference from day one and all this um, devitalised tissue in this wound bed. To day 16, we've managed to remove all of that devitalised tissue from that wound bed. And we can actually see what our wound bed looks like um, or some of our wound bed here. And the results um, for, for Jamie, the pressure also responded um, really well to the management with all prep pad to prepare that wound bed, wound edge and that peri wound skin. And the, the use of the biotone alginate AG to treat that bacterial burden in the wound. And the preparation of the wound bed has allowed the antimicrobial to be able to work effectively 
Because if we're going to use antimicrobials in a wound, it needs to get down to that wound bed. It's no good sitting on devitalised, sluffy, necrotic tissue. It's not going to be able to do anything there. We need to remove those barriers to healing to allow that antimicrobial to work effectively. And it ensured that the wound progressed onto the healing trajectory as we wanted it to. Now, Jamie is much happier and finds the wounds far less painful than he did previously. And he's experiencing far less leakage and maceration. He's got better control of the exudate and bacterial load, in turn, improving his quality of life. And we have um, far exceeded that um, by improving his quality of life because Jamie is now healed. So after 15 years of suffering with this pressure ulcer, Jamie is now healed, which is absolutely amazing. And again, we use just three dressings to do this. Effective wound preparation is key to making sure that we remove those barriers to healing. We can reduce the risk of infection by good wound preparation and making sure that our treatment plan is effective and we're using the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. So that's the end. That brings us to the end of our teaching session today. And I hopefully you have understood the difference between healing by primary intention and secondary intention. We've looked at the gap and the challenges of not managing that gap appropriately. So if we don't manage the gap, we get pools of exudate, which increases our risk of infection. If we have exudate pooling, then this can spill out onto the wound edge and the surrounding peri wound skin and can cause maceration. We've um, had a look at different dressing solutions that are available and what sorts of wounds that these can be used on. And we've talked about how we simplify the management of that gap and whether we need to use multiple dressings or whether we can just use one. Now, you must remember that not all foam dressings will conform to the wound bed. So you need to make sure that you look up um, the products that you're using and what they are able to do. And then we've looked at the treatment objectives of wounds. Um, about the assessment and the preparation of, of those wounds in order to devise that appropriate treatment plan. And we did but this by looking at the case studies. So that brings us to the end of, of this teaching session. And, and I really hope that of the three teach, teaching sessions that we have done, uh, the first one in January on assessment, the second one in uh, February on prepare, and then today's session on treatment. This has really helped you in your in your practice, and I hope that it will help you to simplify your wound management. Um, so we will run these sessions again um, a bit later on in the year. Um, so please recommend them to your colleagues. And I would just like to say thank you for attending the three sessions if you've attended all three. And I really hope that um, it will help you to simplify your wound management in the future. Hi, Ellen, have we got any questions at all? Um, there's been a few questions which I've answered as we've been going along um, about fillers about um you know if there's increased bleeding um or redness to the peri wound skin um so yeah. i've answered them as we've gone along there's none come through since then but lots of um compliments to yourself about it being a really interesting session and thank i would you. agree with everybody who's commented so thank you very much for today and hopefully we'll see people in the next um sessions lovely that's great